it was said to him, Is he killed? Imam Ahmed answered, He is jailed, so that he might return from that. Then he said, Rafa, divination, is a part of magic, but magic is more severe because magic is a branch of kufr. Then Imam Ahmed said, The magician and the kahin, the ruling for both of them is that they are killed or jailed until they repent. Close quote. This is taken from Al-Mughni with Sharh Al-Kabir, volume 10, pages 114 to 115. What that is telling us is that the fortune teller, be it a numerologist, be it someone who reads the palm leaves, the astrologers and others, fall under the judgment of either being asked to repent or they fall under the judgment of being executed, depending on the matter and depending upon the situation. This is a serious affair, and we should not take it lightly at all. Imam al nawawi rahimahullah, says more about the one who has to repeat their prayers for coming to an arraf, a diviner. He says, quote, The scholars have agreed upon the fact that it is not necessary for the one who came to an arraf to repeat the prayers of 40 days. For it is necessary to interpret this, this affair, and Allah knows best. Close quote. This is taken from Sahih Muslim, Bishar al Nawawi, volume 14, pages 226 to 227. What this means to us is that The prayers, their reward is not accepted for 40 days, just for coming to the Arraf. And that the magician and the Arraf and the Kahin or the fortune teller, they're all classed under the same rubric as outside of the faith. You only ask someone to repent if they have gone outside of faith in some affair. And the fact that those who are teaching it are asked to repent shows that they are not held amongst the rubric of Muslims by the Orthodox scholars. That should be a frightening lesson for us to think about the next time we decide to make use of numerology or seeking out someone for numerology or any of these other dark occult arts. But, with all of this said, there could still be the one that is there somewhere in the world doubting, saying that there are examples and evidences in the Qur'an and the Sunnah that show that numerology is valid and that alphanumerically believing and using those numbers that are present can have an effect on one and that it is actually even sanctioned by Allah and the Messenger. There are some who would believe that. We want to ask, what are some of the common excuses that Muslims employ to give credence to numerology? Because there are those that when you come to them with these examples and you state to them that they should not be using numerology, they state that we've, we have evidence. And they quote three or four passages and they confuse others. How will we answer this? How should we, to the best of our ability, show to someone who has fallen prey to numerology that this is wrong.
Thus, one would want to know how would we answer some of the excuses that Muslims employ to give credence to using numerology. The alphanumeric abuse of the Arabic alphabet. What are some excuses that they use? Well, best way to understand or know these excuses is to actually examine them ourselves and then try to provide answers. There are many organizations that purport to be Muslim or helping Muslims that depend heavily on numerology. The Ahmadiyya organization depends on numerology a great deal for the prophecies that it claims for Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian. The Baha'i religion depends heavily upon numerology for prophecies and actions that they claim Baha'u'llah has said or done. The Submitters International, Dr. Rashid Khalifa's organization, depends heavily upon numerology, in fact, to prove the authenticity of the Qur'an. So they have delved headlong into using numerology to try to prove the Qur'an. What are the evidences that they all have in common? that they seek to use. One is taken from Surah Al-Fajr, the 89th Surah, Ayah 3. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَالشَّفْعِ وَالْوَاتْرِ By the even and the odd. Some would take this passage in Surah Al-Fajr, the 89th Surah, Ayah 3, and say, here we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swearing by even and odd numbers. Here is clear evidence that there must be some intrinsic importance in numbers. For why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have sworn by numbers? Why would He have sworn by even and odd numbers? There must be some benefit, there must be some use there must be some intrinsic value in numbers and their effect upon the lives of human beings. The supporters of numerology would use a second text to try to bolster their argument. This text would be from the 74th Surah of the Qur'an, Ayah 30. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَلَيْهَا تِسَعَةَ عَشَرَ And over it are 19. Surah Al-Mudathir, the 74th Surah, Ayah 30. By reading this passage, someone would say, Notice there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentioned the number 19. He just said, over it are 19. Allah clearly mentioned the number 19. So how could we not believe in the use of numbers when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alphanumerically uses numbers to send us messages. The proponents of numerology would then head straight to the sunnah. I would quote a passage where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah witr wa yuhibbul witr Indeed Allah is odd. And he loves the odd. 